Before we uh, prep and drape, I like to put the local in. So we're going to do right internal jugular cannulation. There's various approaches. There's actually an anterior, central, and a posterior. But most of us and most people do the central approach. Now, first of all, when I do this, 100% of the time, I put a roll under the patient's back. And this is very good for intubating, too. So this kind of pulls the chest out a little bit. If you look at the central approach, the landmarks would be the apex of the triangle of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Now, he's kind of thin, so you can see this is the, the sternal, the clavicular mastoid head, and this is the, the uh, no, the, the sternal clavicular head and the sternal notch, and this is the cl clavicular mastoid head. And if you look at the little triangle, you can see just about where they meet. If the patient doesn't have good landmarks, some people turn the head to see the landmarks, but there is actual studies that show the vessel goes lower, so I keep it neutral. But what you can do is draw a line from the sternal notch to the mastoid. So how do you see that? If you, the mastoid, well, I can feel the helix of the ear, so this is the mastoid. So you see it, that line, and this it's along the, uh, the muscle, right? At the level of the cricoid cartilage. Now, reviewing anatomy, the Adam's apple is the thyroid cartilage, so the cricoid would be the one right below it. So a line across and a line along that mastoid. And you see it comes to the apex of that triangle. When you, when you get to that point, you kind of put in the groove here. You kind of feel. Now, if you're too far lateral and you're outside the cleidomastoid hassle and the anterior, this is like where you do an interscaling block. But you want to be back in right here in the triangle towards the ipsilateral nipples. So you put in your local, aspirate, and then um, there is local in the kit, but uh, this way we can start off. And then when I do this afterwards, it's going to be a little break. I'm going to scrub, and because we're going to do this sterilely, meeting the uh, CDC guidelines for full body draping. So that's all we need to do at this point, and now I'm going to scrub. OK, before we actually insert, insert the uh, central line, you should know what is in the introducer kit. Now, we have an arrow kit, but all these kits essentially have the same items in there. So the kit is sterile, so you open it, at, you know. Uh, now, it comes with drapes, but the CDC came out with a guideline for central lines, which is a single body drape, even though we have two, and full draping. And we meet the CDC guidelines, so we don't use these little drapes that come in the kit. Sometimes you contaminate something, you need a little extra feel. So I save them. Now, if you look at all these introducers, what, it, what do the pieces have? The main piece that you're going to put in, of course, this is the, the, this is the side port. The side port has a, a, dilate, a dilator, or is the introducer. It's in the bottom in this kit, so you've got to watch out you don't drive it. So this is the dilator. This piece up here is called the hemostasis valve. It's a one-way valve, but you can't slide it into the vessel without the dilator. So you put the dilator through. And this is just some protective shield, which is garbage. And of course, this is the side arm where the manifold is going to go. Now, if you put this in, it's going to bleed back, so you have to turn it. Now, you could clamp this off, and it won't bleed back. But what they do is they give you a stopcock to connect to the manifold. So what you do is you put the stopcock on. We do that and um, turn it off to the patient so it won't bleed back. This end was where the perfusionist or your assistant or you're going to connect the manifold. And this end, of course, is just another port to inject or whatever. So we'll cover this port and we'll leave the other end open for the perfusionists. And we get that prepared. Now, the other thing, this is the uh, contamination shield for the swan. We don't need it just yet. This is the J wire. Now, if you look at it, it's a J wire because it looks like a J. And this is, you know, there are straight wires, but these kits come with a J. They kind of get around bends. And it has a little piece here for your thumb, so you can just slide it back. And this is kind of the introducer part. So you get that queued up. And this thing is just in case you need to transduce. Uh, you're not sure if you're in the artery or not. Sometimes it's not always very easy. If the patient's got a lot of TR, it could be in the CVP and it still could be squirting out. Now, what you're going to do is, this needle is a 22 gauge, is a locator. The, the wire doesn't go through it. It's kind of the finder needle, the seeker, the finder, the locator, 22 gauge needle. And um, this is the uh, bigger needle. It's 16 inches. It's very hollow point. You can even put the wire through the barrel. So you're going to locate it with the seeker, and then you're going to go in the vessel with the bigger needle. And when that's in, you're going to put the wire through that. 
So now we're uh, ready to actually uh, begin, uh, you know, the insertion. Okay. So now going back to the um, previous um, explanation at the beginning, I like to keep the head in a neutral position. Now with the Sika needle, let me just, just look at my hand. What you need to do with the Sika needle is when you get under the thing is get suction. And what you do is you get about, once you get under the skin, you get about two cc's of suction. You have to be able to move the needle in and out, in and out, without changing the level of the suction. You're not actually sucking the barrel. And once you have about two, you just move the whole thing in and out. Now, the way you hold this thing is like a gun. You put your thumb over here, two fingers, and you pull back here. No, as I always say, no simian grip like this. You're not like a, a chimpanzee. You know, you have to kind of hold it like a gun. So you get it, and you hold it, and you push with the thumb and pull like a trigger. So you get this, you get the needle in your hand, and what you want to do is you want to review the landmark. So you can do it all in one shot. You can take your pinky, and you can go feel about behind the helix of the ear, and you get your thumb here at the notch, and then you have the cricoid, and usually you see where your local is, and you can kind of get right into the triangle again. Now you take the needle, and you want to go towards the ipsilateral nipple at 45 degrees to the spine. Now this is 90 degrees to the spine, like you're doing a cervical block. And this is kind of 15, like when I have you do the arterial line. So 45 is, you know, in the middle there. So notch, mastoid, mark. You get under the skin, a couple of cc's of suction, and you just shoot for the ipsilateral nipple. And there we go. And you, Now, I want you to notice that I have the vessel, and the needle is not in all the way to the hub. So, uh, and usually, most of the time, unless the patient's very heavy, it's pretty much, if you're in the right spot, right under the skin. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this needle in here, and I'm going to take the bigger needle. And what you can do is you can go right over the top. If you're, you know, I don't, but you know, if you're kind of a novice, you don't do this a lot. Now, note that this needle is even longer than the other one. So there's no way you're going to want to go all the way to the hub. So if you don't hit it after, you know, an inch, say, you've got to redirect. Because it's possible even you're kind of, that you're missing it. So let's say we'll go right over and we'll get our suction. And uh, voila, there we are. And it's right in just like downtown. Now, if you pull the needle off, it's going to bleed. So again, I want you to be very neat. So I take a 4x4 four four here, and I put it under. Now, when you take this thing, hold, you don't want to move it. So thumb, index finger, clip it, and just turn it off. Now, you see, if this was in the artery, more than likely it'd be squirting out. Now, if the patient had a lot of TR, uh, it may be coming out too, or a tamponade, and then what you would do is um, use, the, uh, use this thing to kind of transduce it. But I'm pretty sure this is in the artery. So what you do now is you don't want to move the needle. You thumb index finger, you line it up, and then you just slide the wire off. And it should go pretty easily. Now you notice it's going in, and you can continue to use your thumb to push it in. Or once it's in, what I do is I pull back, and I hold, and I push. I hold, push. Hold, push, hold, push, and it's in. Now you, know, now, you don't have to worry. The wire is not going to come out. Just pull the needle out. So now the wire is in. Next thing you have to do is you have to make a skin nick because the introducer will not go in through this small needle hole. So what I want you to do is blade up. you got to get in the same hole that the, that the wire is in. Otherwise, you'll get a skin nick, and the introducer will get hung. And you don't want to go crosswise, you want to go lengthwise. So you get it in, you go about half the blade, so you, it should be though, you know, uh, anesthetized. Get right in there, you go about half the blade. And in younger people, you'll feel the platysma, and, but in older people, it's thin, and it won't, uh, you won't feel the blade pop through it. Now, this may bleed too, so I get kind of a four by four so it doesn't run down the patient's neck. Okay, notice always put your sharps in this. Don't just throw them on the tray. That's how you get stuck. You put them in, they give you a little um, thing for sharps and stick it in there. Now you take your introducer. Now what you want to do is, more than likely, the wire is in farther than the blade. You don't want to push the wire in. So what you do is, because otherwise you've got to go to the cath lab and it's like a real pain in the neck to get the wire out. It can happen though. 
So what you do is you slide it in, and once it's in, I don't move it down. I bring my hand all the way down to the, to the skin, and I slide my hand down, and you see that the wire is not out. So you feed it backwards. And the wire is much longer than the introducer. See, you know what, you don't have to, you can feed it back two, three inches. And then what I do is I kind of move it in here so it's tamponading a little, so it's not bleeding, because I want it to be neat. Now, if you look at this introducer, you see the dilator comes out. This is the widest point, right where my index finger is pointing. When that point is in the vessel, now this is a straight shot. There's no bend. Right subclavian, left IJ, you got to be careful. You can perforate. Uh, with the dilator because it takes a right angle. But right IJ and left subclavian, these are straight shots. So you can push the thing all the way in without worrying about it, about perforating. Now, this is the widest point. So when this point is in the vessel, the rest of the catheter is going to go without resistance. So what you do is you don't put your hand up here because if you don't have a big enough skin nick or if the patient has got tough skin, people work outside or whatever, you know, and they got that sun damage, the skin is kind of leathery. It may bend. So what you do is you put your thumb and your index finger kind of about an, an inch to two inches behind the widest point. And what I do is I kind of tug the little skin to make sure there's no extra fold. And what you're going to do is kind of pop, push it and pop it a little torque. Now when it pops, that's when the wide part is entering the vessel. You don't stop. What you do is you bring your thumb all the way down to the skin. So that at that point, maybe two inches of the wide part is in the vessel then the rest will go. So that's what we're going to do. A little, little tension over here. Push it, pop. See, right to the end. Now my thumb and index finger. So the wide part is in. You slide the whole catheter down, and it's in. It's a straight shot. Again, if you pull the wire out without the dilate, it's going to bleed a lot, right? It's a big lumen. So you've got to pull them both out together, but more than likely, the uh, dilator is going to come out. It's shorter than the wire. So what I do is I, get, I put a 4x4 four four under it, and I pull them both out, and I get my thumb here. See, because it, it bleeds a little, so we don't get blood all over the place. And then I wipe it off. Now, you, if you notice, just like in my art line, there's no bleeding. Right, now I put the bio patch on. Now, sometimes you, you put it through the external jugular, and it bleeds a lot, but... Um, yeah. Again, bio patch, and not like this, but underneath it. Blue to the sky, white to sight, as the company would say. Okay, now if you look at, you need to sew this down. The, the, do not, and you see some practitioners, some of my colleagues even, sew along this blue part here. This is just so the catheter will bend. There's a groove over here. This is actually where the stitch should go. And some people use the eye too. But anyway, the, the securing stitch should go right in this groove. So um, since the sewing point is away from the insertion point, there may not be any, enough local here because I didn't put a huge wide area of local. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put more local in. And there is local in the kit in addition to the local that I had done before we prepped. So we'll draw it up. So I like to secure the uh, central line in two spots so that you don't ever get this kind of thing where in an emergency or a code the thing kind of kinks over because it could happen. And then the, so I'm going to go to the right of this uh, groove and to the left of the groove. Uh, so I'm going to secure it in two spots. Now they give you a straight needle and if you really learn how to sew with something you've got to be taught and practice because you, when, the whole key when suturing is that one suture has to be tight otherwise it's like tying shoelaces. Now the first suture when you put it in, the first stitch, you don't make it super tight because most of you have done ICU nurses. When you cut this thing off the patient you want to have to take a chunk of their skin because it annoys people. So what you do is, it's not super tight. Now the second and third knots are tight, but if you look real close, you see there's kind of like a little loop. So that, you know, in the ICU, you can get a little blade in there and cut it without cutting a chunk of the skin of the patient. Patients don't like that. Now once that's secure, you go, I go underneath and 
See, notice that this is always tight. And the first time you go in the loop, you have to be taught this, it's two stitches and you see it comes down in the groove. And then you never, see there's no, uh, you never loosen up uh, tension on one side. And, and it works real well for tying suture and for wrapping uh, presents and packages too. Um, you come in on the other side and again, I fix it on the other side and I don't pull it so tight that it tents the skin way up. But you know, it has to be firm and two knots and down and again, this way it's secured in uh, two spots. So you can't get this kinking. And then I just put the, some people sew the eye down to the skin, but I already have it secured in two spots. But I do just go, go through the eye, but I don't sew the eye actually down to the skin because I don't think I need three, three securing points. And then you cut it. Okay. Now we're going to insert the swan. So what we're going to do is the, we're using asymmetric swans, so they have to be light calibrated first. The regular swan doesn't. So what we'll do is the perfusionists are going to connect it up. So what we do is we open it, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll throw it off the end that they need. And basically what will happen is everything to, the, to my right will be, quote, contaminated, but everything to the left won't be. So they'll touch that end, and we'll, we'll um, do the light cowl. Now, if you have a regular swan, you don't have to do this phase. You just can pull it out. The whole purpose of this is the tip is in the dark, so it zeroes, it zeroes the sat. If you don't do it, you can draw a PA gas later on and enter it manually. Uh, or if it, the, the cowl fails or whatever, or, or something happens, or you change to the ICU and you don't take the cable, and that's what they do. It they don't, they don't. It doesn't save the data. It takes about 20 seconds. Now, when you come out, you don't want to contaminate this. There's a contamination shield, so you rip it off. Now, if you look at the contamination shield, it has two pieces. This one piece, this little T groove, goes and it fits to the. There's a little nub here on the catheter, and that locks it. And it also has a proximal, two other pieces, where you can lock the swan so it doesn't move on the swan. So first of all, you want to put it in and make sure you put it in this way, not this way. And don't open the bag. It, you just put it through, and then when you get there, you don't want to contaminate it. You pull it all up. Each mark on the swan is 10. The fat mark is 50. So you pull it up to near the end. It doesn't have to go all the way up to the top, maybe 80, 75. And you take it and you lock it. See, now the swan can't move. Now, what we do here is we give you a, uh, an Alice clamp so you can clamp this down. And when you do this, don't clamp the swan so it won't slide off. So this is kind of all contaminated, but this isn't. Now, these swans, there's a PA port, there's two CVP ports, the white one, kind of the VIP port and the CVP. So they all have to be flushed. These oximetric swans all uh, have a heat coil, so you don't have to do injectate. And it, what it does is it obscures the 20 mark. The 20 mark, if you look closely, you can see it, but it's in, the, it's in this coil. This is the heat generating coil. And you check the balloon. You want to make sure that the balloon, A, comes up, B, that it doesn't inflate eccentrically, that it covers the tip. So it seems like it works. So you put it in, you hold your hand here, and you kind of maybe try to get the natural curve of the heart. And before you put up the balloon, you go in about 20 centimeters, and you should be in the right atrium. And we're going to, of course, use the EKG, the uh, monitor to uh, look at the waveform. So in, balloon up. And what you do is you advance it with the heartbeat, one to three beats. And you be cognizant of how far you're going in, because it should be about 30, 35 across the tricuspid valve. Otherwise, you can get a loop. And when you get a loop, you can get a knot. And it's happened to me a few times. So you got to you know, be careful. You just can't keep on inserting it forever. So you insert it, and let's hopefully by 30, 35, see? Now, you may not see the monitor, but it's in the RV, and it's at 29 or so. So same with the swan. Keep going. Now, sometimes here you get a little ectopy, and usually you can work your way through it. Once in a while, the patient fibrillates very rarely. Then you got to defibrillate them. Otherwise, but you do usually get a lot of ectopy, and now you see I'm in the PA. 
Well, you may not be able to see the monitor in about 42. We don't uh, wedge the catheter. We've had a PA rupture and we don't need to do it. So we just leave it here. At this point, balloon down, you move the bag, the contamination shield, and move it so that the excess is all the way down um, close to the body. This way later on, and we don't lock it because what we like to do when they manipulate the heart, the swan can move. So when we, before we go on bypass, we pull it back. Now again, so we're not going to lock it with the locking, but the distal part has that little T piece that goes in the nub and you tighten it. And now it, the shield is locked on, but it's not locked. The swan can still move. If you turn this piece, the swan is locked and it can't move. So we don't do that. We keep it open so we can pull it. And now we're done. Uh, and we'll put our little dressing on it. And at the end of the case, we'll put a nice dressing on, but for now. And uh, that's it. <laughs>